Thank you. It takes me about two hours to give this talk, so uh, six minutes is not going to do it. I'm going to speak at my New Jersey speed. Uh, everything should be as simple as possible, but no simpler, so we'll use Einstein's dictum tonight. I'm going to walk you through the history of information and where this is all headed. I have a foreboding of an America in my children's or grandchildren's time when the United States is a service and information economy, when nearly all the manufacturing industries have slipped away to other countries, when awesome technological powers are in the hands of a very few, and no one representing the public interest can even grasp the issues. Carl Sagan. So, intelligent machines. We go back to oral tradition. For thousands of years, humans could only store information within one lifetime and that information would be passed on orally to an audience, and this would be repeated for millennia. This was improved upon about 5,000 years ago with the Babylonians who invented writing, and for a few thousand years, the same was evolved, eventually being uh, ink on paper. Uh, around uh, the year 1400, there were only 30,000 books in all of Europe, and in 1455, an amazing invention, the printing press in Germany from Gutenberg. Uh, by the time Gutenberg invents it in 1455, if we look 50 years into the year 1500, we now have 20 million books. So we go from 30,000 in a period of 50 years to 20 million. Printing is just one form of information. When you and I go up to the highlight, and we look at trees and the streams, and we have all the smells and all the wonderful wind, all of that enters our uh, body in the form of jiggling and vibrating subatomic particles. And these little particles, including molecules, enter our eye, our ear, our nose, our tongue. And those senses transmit that information in the form of electricity into the brain. The brain then has to take all of that electricity and recreate the outside world. So there's a little delay for thousands of years, this was the only way to experience life. Like when we look at this beach, all of the smells and the sounds of the ocean have to enter first as electricity, and then the brain has to recreate this beach in seemingly real time, but with a little bit of a delay. All of that changes uh, very quickly. Uh, we needed a way to store electricity and chemistry outside of our brain. So for millions of years, all we could do was experience life within our own minds until this brilliant Italian physician uh, named Volta comes up with the first electric battery. So now, instead of having the jiggling of subatomic particles in our brain representing an image or a smell or a taste, we perhaps will be able to externalize that experience. Of course, when uh, this was invented in 1800, no one would have thought of this. Uh, in our museum, we have an original Volta battery uh, shortly after 1800. And basically, it's a sandwich made up of disks of zinc and copper with felt. You soak this in lemon juice, and you get your positive and negative. Well, this allowed electricity now to compute. And the ENIAC was the first general purpose electronic computer in 1946 where electricity was used in, uh, to store and, and calculate what was normally the provenance of our brains was now externalized. Computers became more powerful, but in the 1960s, they would still occupy half of this theater. This is an IBM uh, 360 from about 1964 with about one millionth the power of an iPhone. Uh, and this was state of the art in the 1960s. Then in 1971, an amazing invention, the microprocessor, the entire computer and much more that we saw in the previous slide is packed into a chip the size of the nail on your pinky or smaller. And back then they could store only 2,300 transistors. Today it's four billion transistors in that chip. Well, that leads to the first personal computer in 1975. This is the magazine that announced it. It was called the Altair. And the programming was done by these fellows who signed this for our museum, Bill Gates, Paul Allen, 
Monty Davidoff and Ed Roberts, who invented the computer in 1975. Then one year later, the Apple One. And I know we have a lot of Apple fanatics probably in this room. Well, we have one of 40 left, 200 were made. And this one was given to us by Steve Wozniak, and he signed it uh, last year for us. So the Apple company comes about very shortly after the microprocessor was invented. So here's a chart of what's called MIPS, million instructions per second. And this is the speed of a computing machine. And we start here with the speed of manual calculation, then bacteria, a worm, a spider, a lizard, a mouse, a monkey, and a human. And computers within 20 years are going to match the power of your and my brains. Computers are useless. They can only give you answers. This was Pablo Picasso. He felt that computers without consciousness just give us answers. Well, we're about to leave this world where the computer only gives us a calculation. Kaku tells us that the job market of the future will consist of those jobs that robots cannot perform. Our blue collar work is pattern recognition, making sense of what you see. Gardeners will still have jobs because every garden is different. The same goes for construction workers. The losers are white collar workers, low level accountants. People that we thought were safe from automation are actually the first ones to lose their jobs. Those with mechanical skills are the ones that are going to be replaced less and less by computing. So in June, we're going to open a brand new large exhibit that will be explaining this rise of consciousness on the part of machines and the impact that this will have on everyday life. Thank you very much.